You know, a couple of weeks ago when I was preaching, I confessed that I wish Pastor would, you know, give me a different type of, of message to preach. You know, I'm always getting all these hard ones. And I even said, you know, can I get David and Goliath or something? <laughs> so I didn't know it, but I got David and Goliath. So here we are. Um, this being the year of faith, um, what better? I mean, there's a, a myriad of accounts in Scripture that um, that we can go to and look at examples of what it means to be men and women of faith. Um, but one of the most powerful, I think, uh, amongst all of them in Scripture is the, the account of David and Goliath in Scripture. You know, it's, it's interesting because a lot of times this is used as a, you know, we, we think of David and Goliath as a childhood fairy tale. And uh, sorry, my, my thing keeps falling off my ear here. Not used to wearing glasses and this earpiece, so. But anyway, but you look at this, and this is no childlike story. This is, a, this is a real account in Scripture. This really happened. And I think it's important for us as Christ followers, as Jesus did, to lean into the, the Scriptures and to look at the importance of, of faith and what that looks like as modeled by different people throughout Scripture. So we jump straight into Romans chapter 10, verse 17. And I think this is very applicable here. Um, Consequently, faith comes by hearing, and hearing through the Word about Christ. And for those of us that, that walk in the power of, of, of faith, we understand that that didn't just, didn't just happen. You know, we've been privileged to be afforded the Scriptures and to know God's Word. And our faith comes by hearing and the hearing through the Word about Christ. And that's what drives us. A little side note, I'm going to do my best to stay close to, to Pastor's notes uh, in this. He takes notes different than I do. Um, so we'll, we'll probably veer away a couple times, so just bear with me on that. But I do want to mention the great D.L. Moody has a quote that that talks about faith. And let's read that together. It'll be on the screen. It says this, I prayed for faith and thought that someday faith would come down and strike me like lightning. But faith did not seem to come. And one day I read the 10th chapter of Romans. Now faith comes by hearing and the hearing by the word of Christ. And I closed my Bible and prayed for faith. But now I open my Bible and begin to study and faith has been growing ever since. Faith is not something that just this happens on its own. It, it comes from knowing who God is. And I think that's exactly what we see with David. David didn't just have a Sunday school knowledge of, of about God. didn't even have Sunday school back then. He knew God. He knew God intimately. And as, and as the, the Philistine, the, the Goliath, charges at the Israel's army. The people of God. David is one that's sitting there taking note. And it's like, what is going on here? Because these guys are cowarding at this giant. Now, I, I, can't, I can't imagine facing somebody about nine feet tall. That's a big dude. But the reality is, is that God is bigger. Or do we believe that? We read in Hebrews 11.6, now without faith it's impossible to please Him. And that's true. There's no way as, as, as men and women of God that we can truly and ultimately please God in everything we do unless we have faith. We can attend church regularly. We can, we can be elder, uh, elders. We can be deacons. We can even be pastors. But if we don't have faith, are we really doing anything for God? And the reality is that, no, we're not. We can't truly please God or really do anything with, for God without faith. God must believe that He, we must believe that God exists and understand that He is the rewarder of those who seek Him. 
David, even though he wasn't perfect, and we've, we know about his accounts in Scripture, but yet he believed. He trusted God. Even when the obstacles before him were huge. Were huge. Well, let's continue to read on in, in, in Scripture. You go to 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 10 and 11, where you see how Goliath defies the armies of Israel. He says, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. The reality is the enemy paralyzes those of us of faith or of little faith with fear. He paralyzes us with fear. If you think about it, the different obstacles you've had to face in your life that have come your way. And it's fear that, that cowers us. It's fear that gets us to back down. It's the fear that keeps us from stepping up and stepping out in faith. And the enemy's crafty. He's not going to get you with things you're not afraid of. He's going to hit you at the core. And he's going to challenge you at the depths of your soul. That the things that you fear most is where he's going to hone in on. Because he's not stupid. And the reality is, we've got to find ourselves, are we like David? Or again, like we talked about a few weeks ago, are we like Saul? Because there's a big difference. And here, Saul <laughs> continues to lean in on his own understanding and coward in fear. But the account of David and Goliath confirms why God chose David over Saul. Why God chose his bro uh, David over his brothers and all of Israel. Because David, as we just heard, had an unwavering faith, a faith that could not be shaken. He didn't really know the outcome, but he did because he trusted God. You know, there was um, a movie that came out uh, not too long ago. I, I don't know exactly. It's been 10, 15 years. I don't know. And the, the acting is marginal at best. But the message in it is Supernatural. It's called Facing the Giants. Anybody ever seen Facing the Giants? If you haven't seen that, it's worth watching. You know, it's about a high school football team that was, they were marginal too. And they were up against some incredible odds. But the coach used it as an opportunity to teach them not just about the game of football, but about the game of life. And he used it to paint a picture that, you know, we've got to trust God. I can't guarantee we're going to win a state championship. But I can guarantee that you're going you're gonna to leave the best you can out on that football field because you're going to trust in who God is and who God made you to be and the skill he gave you to be as a, as, as a football team. And I think it's a powerful, powerful testimony that David embodies here. And I don't know what, I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what giants you're facing in life. I don't know what obstacles that are standing square face to face with you. But I know one thing certain, that it's the faith that you have in God that's either going to get you through it or it won't. And I say it won't because if you don't have true faith, if you don't have faith that can move mountains, then you will lose. But if you trust in the God of the universe, the God who spoke stars in existence, the God that made you and formed you in your mother's womb, the God that sent his son to die in your place so that you could have a relationship with Him. If you trust in that God, then there's nothing that can stand before you. And when God is, is on your side and He's leading you to whatever it is He's calling you to, nothing can stand before you. In 1 Samuel 17, 26, David spoke to the men who stood by him saying, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach for Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God. And here is the, 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 the crazy thing, the paradox about this whole thing. Goliath had unshakable faith in himself, right? He had unshakable faith in himself. And we all know that faith in ourselves, just limited to that, is futility, Right? That if we just have confidence in our own abilities, our own skills, our own knowledge, our own wisdom, 
then we're limited. But when we recognize that the skills that we have in life didn't come by accident, it was something that God gave us. The ability to learn, the aptitude of learning, when, when, when the, the things that we can do that God has afforded us, those talents and those skills and that knowledge and the ability to think, and we recognize where that comes from, then nothing can stand in our way if God's called us to it. And that's a truth. But this, this came from a knowledge of who God was. David didn't have confidence in himself. You don't, he, he has confidence in who God made him to be and the God of Israel. David says in, in 1 Samuel 17, 32, he said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. And I don't know about you, but how many of you all have ever fought a bear? You ever fought a bear? I mean, some of you might think some of your friends are bears or your boss is a bear, but like a bear. Okay, maybe a bear. But what about a lion? You ever fought a lion? No, I haven't. And I like how David sits there and says, you know, when I was out in the garden of sheep and a lion and a bear came, man, I took care of them. I trusted God. He gave me a task to take care of these sheep and I stepped up to the plate because of who God is. And the same thing that happened to this lion and bear, guess what? It's going to happen to this loudmouth, arrogant, you know what? Because that's what Goliath was. He was just an arrogant dude that, that had more confidence in himself than anything else to have sense about something greater. And he, he was mocking God. And David said, nope. That ain't going to happen on my watch. But I wonder, and I think about this because I'm talking to myself, how many of us just sit back and cower at what God is calling us to do because of the obstacle that's standing right before us? I mean, you see what happened. And in in when we were listening to the word of promise, David and Goliath go toe-to-toe and they start jawing at each other. Goliath says, "Who? I mean, what do you think, I'm a dog that you come at me with sticks? And then David just lets in and said, dude, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill you. You're going down. And I don't know about all the science behind all this, but he didn't, he killed, he knocked Goliath out with a slingshot and rocks. And I think sometimes that miracle, that supernatural set of events is overlooked I think God was saying, look, I don't care what you got to go to war with. Just go what you got. Trust me, I've got this. And that's exactly what happens. David killed Goliath with some stones and a sling. Here's something. You've got something David didn't have. He had a relationship with God and he knew God intimately. And that, that's important. That's, that's key. But if you sit in here and you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you have the power of the Holy Spirit that can keep you where God wants you to be and use you to do what God wants you to do. I'm going to divert a little bit from pastor's notes, but I feel like it applies here. And I, um, I've been trying to take better care of myself. As I approach the big 4-0 in the next year and a half or in the next year and a month, I figure that it's good to, you know, eat a little bit better, do a little more exercise, you know, all that kind of stuff. And um, now I'll confess last night I had a big, big fat cheeseburger and french fries from Denny's. <laughs> but I'm trying not to eat fried food anymore and do all that kind of stuff. I'm trying to eat more salads and exercise more. And in fact, I've started riding this bike. It's a stationary bike. But I, I try to do like eight, eight miles a day, you know, nothing crazy, 30 minutes, just hitting it hard. But it's stationary. And so, you know, the downside about stationary or treadmills, you're looking at the same thing the whole time. So I was sitting there thinking, okay, what could I do with this time? Now, the funny thing is, is when I started doing it, you know, I had my iPhone out there and I, I, I stumbled upon this Amazon music thing because we have Amazon Prime. It's amazing. If you don't have it, I'm going to give a shameless plug for Amazon music because it's amazing. You get all this music you can stream for like, included in the cost. But anyway, so I'm, I'm, I'm jumping into my inner 90s child and I'm pulling up all these 
these these 90s hit songs, you know, busting out Black, the Backstreet Boys in sync, you know. Uh, if you were at Operation Joshua, you know what I'm talking about. Um, but if you, if you didn't, that's okay. But I'm, in, I'm just riding the bike and I'm enjoying this stuff. And then the next thing you know, I was like, you know what? Dude, I'm going to get the Rocky soundtrack. I'm going to get the Rocky soundtrack and I'm going to start working out to Rocky. I'm going to ride this bike. So when I'm, I can't go anymore, you know, dun, 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 dun. I mean, you're going in it, but I'm hitting it. You know, getting strong now, going to fly now. Boy, I was just oh, pedaling, pedaling, pedaling. Anyway. So I did all that, and I was like, you know, there's something better I could do with this time. And it's not because I'm a pastor or trying to be super holy or anything like that, but I was like, you know what, I can do, because I'm trying to read through the Bible every year, and I do that two ways. I do it through reading and listening and all that stuff, so I have a little app on there where I can listen to the Bible. So I started listening to the Bible. But that normally takes about 15 minutes, so I got another 15 minutes. It's like, what could I do with that? And I was like, oh, I can listen to sermons, Right? because that's what every good pastor does. And so I, I listen, uh, I'm a big Francis Chan fan. I drink the Kool-Aid. I know Andrew Brown does too. Um, but I, I like Francis Chan. I've, I've read, uh, he's written three books. I've only read two of them. I'm, I'm looking forward to reading the next one. But just the guy that really just cleans my porch, really God uses him to really move in me. And I got the opportunity two weeks ago to, to hear him in person. He was at a, this thing called a Youth Pastor Summit that's held over at Universal Studios for youth pastors and youth workers. And there was about 2,000 of us packed into that room. And he, he shared a message that really just punched me around. And I think it fits into this. And he was talking about our prayer life. And not only did he speak that message, but another message I stumbled upon his on YouTube, it was the same thing. I was like, really, man? But I got really convicted by that there, about how I pray as a father, as a husband, and as a pastor for people. And I'm not saying it's bad to pray for people, specifically, you know, if they're dealing with an addiction, to pray that people get free of that addiction. That's a good thing to pray, right? Or if, you know, you know Johnny's struggling at school, pray for Johnny to, to do better in school, to be motivated to do better in school. Or, you know, if you're struggling with whatever, to pray that God helps them as they, they work through this situation. But one of the things Francis said that just really hit me is that do you pray for people to have the power of God in their lives? I was like, well, yeah, I do. Not really. You know, I pray for people's symptoms. But I don't pray, I hadn't been praying consistently for the heart. And so he jumps to a passage in Ephesians where, think about this, the Apostle Paul, the dude was brilliant. The Apostle Paul was brilliant. He was smart as smart can be. He knew the, the Old Testament backwards and forwards. God radically transforms him, and he is the pioneer of the first century church, right? God used Paul to church plant around the Mediterranean Sea. And so... God used this guy, but Paul knew, even with all of his knowledge, that he could give the best sermons, that he could, you know, lay out the letter of the law and all that stuff, but he knew if the church was going to survive, if the church was going to be what the church needed to be, then they'd have to embody faith that would carry each generation on and on and on, right? They knew faith was required. Paul understood that, but he knew that faith wouldn't come by him preaching. I mean, that would help, but it wasn't going to be limited to that. Paul knew that. And I think this is critical to understand the, the kind of faith that David had. Paul knew that he had to go to God and ask God to bestow that type of power in the first century church in order to do what the first century church needed to do to survive. Because remember, it wasn't like church is today here in America. It wasn't a popular thing to be a part of the first century church. It wasn't easy. They were persecuted. They had to rally together, live together, do things together that was, it kind of blows our minds when we think about in order to be the church, right? So look at, look at what Paul prays, and this is in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 14. And this is something that's been convicting me because I want to pray like this. This is what it says. It says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, recognizing that all things come from God, all people come from God. 
And he says this, I pray that he may grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, and that the Messiah may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and the width and the height and the depth of God's love. And to know the Messiah's love and to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge. To know this love that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Woo! That's power, folks. And Paul knew he was not going to be able to just gift wrap them. Here you go. He knew he was going to have to hit his face before God and pray that kind of prayer right there. Because that's what was going to carry the church on for generations to come. Because if they had limited faith, like so often many of us exhibit, the church would have tanked. Paul knew that was required. David had that kind of faith. It's the same. I believe Paul is praying for the first century church to have the same faith that David had when he faced Goliath. And here's the reality. I feel shame on me as a pastor for not praying that for our students, or more so, not praying that for my wife and my kids, but that's changed. Because that's how I pray. Because here it is. We all want our kids to do well, right? We want our kids to make wise choices, right? We don't like to see our kids mess up, do we? We want to help them from that. Here's the reality. You know, the only way that's going to happen is if they're filled with the fullness of God. No other way. You can get them to come to every function that we have here at the church, and we're going to do our, their best, our best to give them the knowledge, but unless they're filled with the fullness of God, it's not going to take. Here's the thing. For all my kids, we pray for their future spouses. And I want my kids to be responsible and all that stuff, but I'm not praying for them to have the best job in the world. I'm not praying for anything else except for them to be filled with the fullness of who God is. Because if I want Joanna and Elena and Lydia to find the right man for the rest of their lives, they're going to have to be filled with the fullness of God because if they're not filled with the fullness of God, they're going to lean on their own understanding and chances are they're going to make a poor choice. But i got to pray that. If I want my, life, my wife to live upright, to be the woman that God wants her to be, that I don't just pray that she doesn't do this or that, I pray this. That she'll be rooted and grounded in love and may be able to comprehend with all of the saints the width and the length and the depth and the height and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Amen. That is required. And if we're going to be the church to reach the next generation or to reach this generation, then we've got to start praying like this. We've got to have faith like David that when we're standing before the Goliaths in our lives, that we're, we don't waver because we know we're filled with the fullness of God and we can do anything that God has called us to do through His power. Sorry, I'm spitting on you folks down here. My bad. <laughs> the Philistine said to David, Come, come to me and I will give you your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And David spouts off right back at him, no, you won't. You know why? Because he knew God. He didn't just have some knowledge. He knew Him. And he knew he could trust Him. The armies of Israel had their eyes on Goliath, but the da David had his eyes on Yahweh Sabaoth. He had his eyes on God. And there was nothing going to stand in his way of doing what God wanted him to do. Astronomers have uncovered a near record-breaking record -breaking supermassive black hole. Any astronomers in the room? Anybody look at astrology or anything like that? But anyway. And I don't know how astronomy, not astrology, but astronomy. Sorry. See, I, it's like, yeah, we don't do that either. Um, <laughs> astronomy. I don't know how in the world they measure what they measure. I mean, what's a light year? I mean, I don't know. It's big. It's a, it's, it's a long time. But apparently, they've measured this supermassive black hole as to weighing 
the equivalent of 17 billion suns. You know how much the sun weighs? You can probably look it up. Google it. Um, it weighs a lot, I, I guess. But this black hole, it, you know, it's the, I don't know how you do that, but they, they, they talk like that, so it's cool. So let's, it's big. So this black hole is big. And the equivalent of 17 billion suns. And basically, it's in an unlikely place in the center of the galaxy in a sparsely populated area of the universe. And the observations made by NASA's Hubble Space Telescope and Gemini Telescope in Hawaii may indicate that these monster objects may be more common than once thought. Okay. You know who breathed that into existence? The God we're talking about. The God that Goliath was mocking. The God that created you. The God that gives you the ability to take every breath that you're taking right now. The question is, do you believe that? Do I believe that? Because if I believe in a God that's bigger than that, I mean, is there really anything that can stand against me when I'm doing what God wants me to do? I mean, they're gonna. He's, I mean, they're gonna try. The enemy is 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 gifted in trying. But no. David had his eyes on the infinite one who created the stars, who created the universe, who created all things. And the cool thing about this amazing God is that he wants intimacy with you and me. And the reason why I know that is because he went through great lengths through giving his son to, to live and die on the cross and raise him up in three days again so that we can have a relationship with that one. God doesn't ever, 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 ever want you to live in fear. Never. The only fear God wants you to have is fear of Him. Healthy fear. And then He wants each and every one of us to boldly go and do whatever it is He's asked us to do no matter what. So, I'm going to conclude with this. Goliath was an ant to David. How big is your God? How big is your God? Jesus himself said in Matthew 17, 20, says, because of your unbelief, for surely I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you'll be able to say to this mountain, he didn't say a hill, he said a mountain, move over here, move from here to there, and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. David he had that faith. Nothing was impossible. But I think the only way, me preaching hard or anything like that ain't going to get us there. we got to begin to pray for each other, that passage in, in Ephesians 14. So my prayer for Delton Alliance Church as an associate pastor here is this. That we, the church, through His glorious riches may be strengthened with power through His Spirit in our inner beings and that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. And I pray that each and every one of us in Christ will be rooted and firmly established in love. And that we may be able to comprehend with all those saints that have gone on before us what is the length and the width and the height and the depth of God's love. And that we as Delta Alliance will know Christ's love that surpasses all knowledge and that each and every one of us will be filled with the fullness of who God is. That's my prayer for you. And I ask you, I beg of you, pray that for us as leaders. Pray for Pastor Brad, myself, Pastor Mike, Pastor Dave, Pastor Bill, our team, pray for us to be filled with the fullness of God. Not with just wisdom and knowledge from our experiences, which is cool, but that's not going to do it. We're not going to be able to lead this church unless we're filled with the fullness of God. I mean, we'll lead it, but we won't lead it where God wants it. Will you do that? Because when we stand before giants, and giants are coming, if you're not standing before one now, if you haven't just stand against one, there's one coming. I want to be able to talk smack like David did and be like, dude, you're beat. 
Let's pray. Father, I thank You for this privilege. Lord, I, I thank you, you gave me David and Goliath to, to teach. What a powerful passage. But Lord, I pray that it's not just something we can get excited about and, you know, we got this. But Lord, I pray that we can embody that same type of faith in you that David did. And that we'll understand where this comes from. It can't be manufactured by our own doing. That this type of faith has to be ushered in through the power of the Spirit. That we have to humbly come before You, bow our knees before You and ask that You will help us to understand who You are. And that knowledge of who You are, God, I know will help us to know the depths of Your love for us. And that love and the knowledge of that love will surpass every other thing that we know about and be the thing that drives each and every one of us to be who you have created us to be in your image. So Lord, if there's folks in here today and, and, and I'm there too, you and I have had a great weekend together, Lord, and I'm thankful that you reminded me if I fix my eyes on you, I shall never fear because you are there. You are with me to see me through whatever it is you've called me to. So Lord, I pray that for our people. Help us to trust you. Help us to know you. Help, help us to want you and care more about what you think than anything else in this world. Give us that faith. Again, let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight because you are a rock and our redeemer. We love you, Jesus. We pray it in your name. Amen.